this being the first evening of our summer series. We had a devotional service last week. I appreciate David Smith leading that very much. Uh, we didn't have a guest speaker scheduled to come in, but it was because it was camp week and we had so many people away. Uh, but we're thrilled to get started tonight with the theme of our summer, which is Fixing Our Eyes on Jesus. And that is the title of James Waugh's uh, lesson tonight, Fix Your Eyes on Jesus. And we're thrilled to have uh, James and Deborah with us this evening. And it was nice to sit down and uh, have a meal with them over the last couple of hours and spend some time visiting that we haven't been able to do before, even though uh, we've nearly crossed paths a few times in the past. And just appreciate them being here so very, very much. Uh, James grew up in Tipton, Oklahoma. His mom and dad were house parents at Tipton Children's Home. He went to Oklahoma Christian and got his bachelor's degree in youth ministry there. He and Deborah married. They had known one another since uh, first grade, he said, and became uh, high school sweethearts after that and were married and have been married now for 36 years. They have three children, Derek, who is married to Courtney, Haley, who is married to Jacob, and Logan, who is married to Hallie. They are very blessed with four grandchildren, Fletcher, Silas, Emerson, and Everly. It was while he was a senior at Oklahoma Christian that he began doing an internship with the Memorial Road Church there in Edmond, and then upon graduation accepted a position as their full-time youth minister, a role in which he and Deborah would serve for 17 years before transitioning for four years into outreach ministry. And then he transitioned into pulpit ministry, going to the Hillsboro Church in Nashville for seven years, and then the McDermott Road Church in Plano for six years, before moving to uh, Mustang and beginning to work with the Lake Oma Church last, about this time last year, was it? Okay, July of last year, so coming up on a year. And uh, I came to love James even before we, we met personally, long before we met personally, because he and Deborah were going to work with a group of people that were very near and dear to our hearts. And um, I, I love you guys even more for the ministry that you did there and uh, just the love that, that that church has for you guys, just as God's people have everywhere where you've served. So James, come on up and we'll pray together. Disregard this clock on the podium. It is not 433. And uh, don't, don't think you've entered a time warp. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, and the salvation that you have given us through your son, Jesus. And Father, we rejoice that we have been called to follow him as disciples, that we seek to be like our teacher. And Father, thank you for uh, these men who have prepared their minds and their hearts, uh, prepared these messages to share with us that will help us. Uh, keep Jesus ever in the forefront of our eyes, our minds, and our hearts as we seek to walk in his steps daily. Father, thank you for James and Deborah, for their love for you, their love for one another, the way that you have blessed them as a family, the way that they have blessed your family with the talents, abilities, and, and energy that they bring to service among your people. Uh, Father, again, thank you for uh, the message that we will hear from you and from your son through James tonight. We give you our thanks and ask every blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, it's good to be here. It's good to be with Tim. We do have a lot of mutual friends. We have a lot of loved ones that we love, both of us, very deeply from the congregation that we both served in. And I count it a privilege to be here tonight, to be with him, and uh, to be with you as well. Now, I want you to know I did not wear this shirt to entice uh, conflict between Broken Arrow and Mustang, even because you well know that y'all probably have a lot more state championships than Mustang does. Yes? <laughs> Do y'all even care about the, the Broken Arrow High School? Okay. So, I, I wore this shirt for a reason, and the reason I wore this shirt is when I got to Mustang, one of the things that I, in my DNA, as, an, as a preacher, as an individual, was to try and get to know my community. When I was in Edmond there at the Memorial Road Church and spent four and a half years as community outreach minister, it was probably the most unbelievable time of my ministry that I've ever done over the 36, 37 years of ministry 
that I've had. It was fantastic. Because one day we'd be out uh, delivering hams and Thanksgiving turkeys and everything to a family that had uh, dirt floors only five miles or six miles from Edmond, our church building there at the Memorial Road Church, out in Luther. And the next day we'd be in the uh, mayor's office talking about how we could actually help the community there in Edmond. So one of the things I want to always do and wanted to do is drop into this little town of Mustang, Oklahoma, a town of 20,000, and just see what it would be like to be a part of that community. And so there were some things that went on that made that possible. And one of the, but one of the things I did was, is I just planted myself the first week I was there. I said, you know what, I'm going to go to Starbucks, and I'm just going to study there. I don't want to be a person who's in the office all the time. I really want to be a person out in the community, and I'm going to do a lot of my study out there. I told the elders that, and they were like, go. We, that's exactly where we want you. And so I was out there, and I was uh, sat down in one of the tables. And I noticed that there were some people over the side there, and I sat down there the next day, because I got there real early, about 645. And I was studying there, and the next day I noticed that I had taken a group of people's place. I had taken their table. And I noticed that, and I, so the next time I was in there, I actually moved over from there and found a little place to myself. And this little group just got together every morning, and they were there talking. There was about five or six of them talking. Well, that was in the summer. When it got about September, October, it got cold, and the door was right there. And as the door flew open, it would stay open, and it would blow cold air right into that table. And they finally decided that wasn't the place they needed to stay. And so they moved over right next to me, right next to where I was. And I just kept on going. I usually have my earphones on. I just have my computer out. And I just, I am one of them now. (laughs) And what's interesting about this is, is that I am in the midst of a group of community people made up of all different backgrounds, come from all different areas, all different faiths. And I didn't choose them. They chose me. And I didn't do anything for that to happen. Now, I believe the Spirit of God was at work in all this. I do believe that. But I didn't do anything to make that happen. But it was what has happened in the meantime has been an incredible journey of getting to know the individuals in that group. One's in his 70s who's a retired NSA guy of 30 years. He was the one listening to all your conversations. The other guy is a doctor. He's about my age. He works just across the street, has a strong faith, goes to a community church. There's another couple, Randy and Mary. And Randy is probably one of the top advertising guys in all of Oklahoma City. He's been on a lot of commercials. Everybody knows him as he comes in. He's 60, and he looks like he is like a model. He wears the European garb, and he's always trendy and everything like that. And his wife is Mary, and she's a business consultant, very pretty. And then there's Bob, and Bob's the former uh, pastor at the Methodist Church. And then there's Larry. Larry's just down the street from me in the Baptist Church. And then there's Dixie and Jim. And Jim calls himself a man in whom there are no scruples. That's how he defines himself. In other words, what that means is every joke that he tells at that table, I can't share with you. Okay? So that's what I'm dealing with. And even though most of them would say, every one of them would say, there's a spiritual component there in every one of their lives, 
their language probably doesn't reflect, some of them, their language doesn't reflect what I would say. And their philosophies are totally different in many ways. What they believe and what they don't believe. And the question is, is as a believer, as someone who has kind of been adopted into their group, in fact, one of the men there had a cabin in uh, Colorado, and he said, you need to go sometime. So I went. It was about 3,000 square feet. It wasn't a cabin. <laughs> it was awesome. So Deborah and I went. It hadn't been too long ago. But how do you approach that group? How do you make an impact in the lives of people in your community? It's interesting to me that there are 32,000 different Christian, distinct, different tribes in our world. 32,000 distinct Christian groups in our world today. Every one of them have their own way of looking at things. Every one of them have their own way of seeing the scriptures. Every one of them have their interpretation and their traditions that they hold to. Every one of them are holding to something that they believe is true. Or they wouldn't be a distinct group, they would join some other group. Every one of them say they know the way to find the truth. And in talking to them, it would be easy for me to get off in the weeds and to talk about all the things that we disagree with. And we could have conversations like that, but I guarantee you, if I had conversations like that with the people that were around me right now and those people that are sharing that space with me in Starbucks, they would find another place to either have coffee or they would find another place in Starbucks to start meeting. There's one thing that I believe that there is very little debate that you can talk about, that to talk, debate to have over one subject when it comes to talking to other individuals. And I believe that one subject that you can talk to with anybody because there's little debate over this individual is we can always come back to Jesus. Jesus is the one we need to fix our eyes on and teach and preach and lift up when we're talking to other people. Because I believe when I was taught, I was like, hey, you need to talk to them about this. You need to talk to them about this. You need to talk to them about this. I want to make an impact in my community. I want to have the same love that Jesus had. And so this, this evening what I want to do is I want to challenge you with something. I want to push you or I want to pull you either way. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to take you on a journey. About three years ago, about three years ago, I came to a crisis in my life. Not so much a crisis of faith, but a crisis of really what is true. What's really true when it gets right down to it? And I wanted to answer this question, because this question is a question that I needed to answer. What is truth as is in the mind of God? Not in the mind of any writer, not in the mind of anybody that stood up and has, has preached sermons. Not in the mind of all those different people that are out there today that says, here I've got this, here I've got this, here's what I believe this says, here's what I believe this says. No, 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 no. I wanted to find out what was true in the mind of God. I'm still on that journey. I haven't really attained to that yet. I hope I never do because I love the seeking, and I love the under, trying to understand what is in the mind of God. Seeking it from his angle and his truth and not what I've been told, what I've been shown 
and say, well, you've got to believe this, you've got to believe this, you've got to believe that. No, no. What does, what's, what's true in the mind of God? I give you this first scripture that I think all of us know, but let me read it to you anyway. And it says this, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So my question is, is where would you begin and why? Where would you begin and why? I'm going to go back. Okay. Where would you begin and why? I want to begin with Jesus. Okay? That's where I'm going to begin in my life because I believe that's where, what God has said. God has said, people, listen to me. I want you to listen to my son. That's what God said. So if I'm trying to find truth in his mind, and I'm trying to find out exactly who I'm supposed to be talking about and what I'm supposed to be saying, then I know for one that I need to be, be talking about Jesus Christ because God said so. From his mouth he said so. When he said this, he was still speaking when a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Make Jesus the focus of your attention. People, people, people. I mean, this is loud. This is what Jesus said. And of course, this is on the Mount of Transfiguration. I understand that there were only three people there. And Jesus was there with Peter, James, and John. And those were the only three that, that said that. And yet, here it is, and they're wanting us to know, here's what God said. God said, listen to him. What's interesting about that is, is that God already said that back in Deuteronomy when he was talking to Moses. Listen to this in Deuteronomy chapter 18. I will raise up for you, for, uh, up from them, a prophet. This is God speaking to Moses. Like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words, listen, I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or he, who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Way back in Moses, God looks at Moses and says, Hey, Moses, I'm going to raise up for you a prophet from amongst your people, and this prophet is going to get words that were commanded from me, and he is going to speak, and I want you to listen to him. Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. In fact, you see that fulfillment in Acts chapter 3, verse 22, where it says this, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. All I want to do tonight is just go through some scriptures. I just want you to see what God is trying to help us see and help us understand. It is so easy to say, well, James, James, wait, wait, wait. What about worship? I mean, you've got to talk to these guys about worship. Jesus talked about worship. You worship me in spirit and truth. You, well, you, you've, got to, you've got to talk to them about baptism. Jesus talked about baptism. We start with Jesus because that's who Paul started with and every other writer started with. They came back to him. They made him the priority of their life. In John chapter 10, verse 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, 
and I know them. They follow me. So this is really big for me. Because when I have when I have Lori that stands in front of me, she's just she's not a part of the group. Everybody kind of knows her. She just has that order that she gets. You know, you order it on your phone. You come in, you grab your your stuff from Starbucks, and then you leave. Lori's Catholic. Got two kids, husband. Her sister's daughter just committed suicide. Her husband, on Monday of last week, fell straight down off a 20-foot ladder and broke his foot in four places, had surgery today. And her heart is hurting because of her sister. And what hope can you give to someone in 30 seconds as she's getting her drink and waiting for that before she goes out that door to help her? What do you give her? You talk to her about Jesus. Talk to her about Jesus. Long ago, and many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Hebrews 3, verse 1 says, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of your confession. Of your confession. People, Jesus reigns supreme. He reigns supreme. And we need to make Jesus the focus of our attention when we're talking to people and other people. We can, as I said, we can talk about a lot of other things. That comes later. You want to make an impact on the people at your work? You want to make an impact with the students that you have in your class? You want to make an impact with your friends? Most of us don't even talk about our faith anymore. We don't. Because none of us know where to start. None of us know what to say. Well, they've got their beliefs. I've got my beliefs. I know we, don't, we, don't, we just don't get together. None of ours are exactly the same, so therefore I can't talk to them. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And you can have great conversations with people who are totally different than you. Mr. Bob, the pastor of the Methodist Church, the former Methodist Church, you know what I learned from him? Every once in a while, he gets dressed up, and he goes to all these churches, and he's all dressed up just like Jesus would have been, the staff and everything, and he goes and he quotes the Sermon on the Mount, and all he does is just preach Scripture. What an amazing thing to hear Jesus' words. How great that is. And what I want you to know is I, I'm still trying to find out why is this so important to God? This is my, this is my journey of why is this so important to God? I, I want to know why is this so important to God? And it's important to God because he says, I've given all authority to him, to Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That was our password at McDermott Road. Matthew 28, 18. For all the computer stuff, all authority has been given to me. We don't use it now. Everybody knows it now. So anyway. <laughs> but all authority on heaven and earth, Jesus said, has been given to me. Matthew 11, verse 27 says this. 
All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. John 17, verse 2 says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all you have given him. So what would you say to my friends at Starbucks? What would you say? Using the vast number of red letter words that Jesus spoke, where do you begin to have a conversation with them? Where do you begin to have a conversation with them? Here's what I want you to know, and this goes back to that Deuteronomy 18 passage, that Deuteronomy 18 passage which said, I'm going to put words in his mouth. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 12, verses 44 through 50, okay? Very, very important. This is from Jesus. Now, God has spoken it already in, in Deuteronomy chapter 18. He's told Moses that. And listen to what Jesus says about the same passage back in Deuteronomy chapter 18 when he says this. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him. Oops, sorry. Where am I? I'm ahead, or did I forget that passage? Okay, get your Bibles out. <laughs> Come on. I want you to listen to this. This is so important. So let me, let me set the scene. This is right before the upper room scene. For Jesus actually washes the disciples' feet. This is John chapter 12. There's no reference to why this is here. It didn't tell you where he is. It didn't tell you what time it was. It's just like put right here, right before you get to all this discourse from chapter 13 to, ch to the chapter 18, verse 1, which I believe is all in the upper room. So all that, that time is right there. A lot of it's on the Holy Spirit, if you remember. And here's what Jesus says before all that. And John puts this here for a reason. Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. Listen, listen, because this is so important. This is what Jesus says. The words that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, wait, Jesus, what did you just say? The words that I have spoken will judge you on the last day. Me? You're going to judge me with your words, Jesus? Yes, the words that I have spoken will judge you on the last day. That's what Jesus says. And then he says this. For I have not spoken on my own authority. Jesus is saying, I didn't, hey, I'm not speaking on my own authority here. But the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment. What to say and what to speak. Every word that came out of Jesus' mouth were words that were guided by God. Guided by God. Every single one of them were words that Jesus spoke because God commanded him to speak those words. Why? Because Jesus was the Word and is the Word. And I know that His commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So what do you say to my friends? Where do you start? You've got all these words of Jesus. You've got all these words you could use. Let me tell you that I believe that Jesus waits passages. He has waited passages. And he begins with that weighted passage. So, do you remember the story? The lawyer comes before Jesus and he, and he says, Hey, what's the greatest commandment? What's the greatest commandment? Teacher, tell us the greatest commandment in law. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your heart, soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Now look at, look at that. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus said, you want to know what's important here? You want to know what's most important? Let me take a section of scripture that you know well, that you knew from the time you were born, that was the first thing that came out of your mouth, which we call the Shema as, a Jewish, as Jews, and we want you to memorize that from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. So you memorize, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That was the Shema. Everyone said that when they got up in the morning. They said it before they went to bed at night. That was the thing they quoted. And Jesus says, and then he goes like this. He goes to Leviticus chapter 16, and he goes, wait, wait, wait. Let me pull this one little scripture out of here, and let me put it right here, and I'm going to put some weight on it, and I'm going to say the, everything. Everything in the law and the prophets, everything that I say depends on these two things. You love God. You seek his highest good, and you seek to do him no harm. And you love your neighbor as yourself. And you seek to do your neighbor no harm. And you love them. And you seek their highest good. And on everything else, whatever you do, it comes back to that. You love God. You love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. And then Jesus raises the stakes one more time. When he says in John 13, 34, he says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. You love other people the way I love them. You love them and show them the compassion. You show them the grace. You show them the forgiveness that I showed them. You want to know how to act when you're around other people? Let me tell you how to act. Act like me. Treat other people like I did. And Jesus raises his stake and we go, whew, I don't know if I can do that. It's really tough. I like holding this anger in that I've had so, much, so long for my fellow brother. I like having that resentment in my heart. I'm not going to show them grace after what they did to me. And I'm not going to show them mercy. And as far as justice, see, it gets really tough when you start talking about people and how this really works in their lives. So what does this look with my Starbucks friends? Let me give you a couple of things, and then the lesson will be yours. The first one is, is I will not condemn or judge them. I am not going to condemn my Starbucks friends, and I'm not going to judge them. Why? Because Jesus did not come to condemn the world. In John chapter 12, we already said, he did not come to judge the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to this world to condemn the world. But in order that the world might be saved through him. And here's that passage. In, in, uh, so next one. Let's go on. I left another scripture out. Next one. I will view everyone as one who has value to God. When I see whoever it is at Starbucks, when you see another individual that's walking down the street, when you see the person who is at your gas station and you go in there every time to get your Cheetos and Dr. Pepper, okay, some of you do, you go in there to get your Cheetos and Dr. Pepper and you give them your money and you never say hi, you never start a conversation with them because, well, they're just that person behind the counter. That person behind the counter is loved by God. That person behind the counter has a soul. That person behind the counter needs Jesus. And we need to be Jesus to that person. 
For the Lord your God is the God of all gods, and the Lord of lords is the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribes. He's not partial. He doesn't pick favorites and say, here's my favorites and here's my not favorites. He loves them all, and I love this verse in Ezekiel chapter 18. It's one I memorized and, and read plenty of times after Osama bin Laden was killed. And all the Facebook pages go, woohoo, we got him. We killed him. Finally, the enemy of our country. And God says this. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Declares the Lord God. And not rather that they should turn from their way and live. Listen to it in chapter 33, 11. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O Israel? Third thing and last thing is, is I will love others as Christ loved them. I will try and love others as Christ loved them. I will seek their highest good and I will seek to do them no harm. And that's what you saw right there in Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to point people to the words of Jesus. I'm going to point people to the words of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. People, Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. Let's make him Lord of our life. Let's do what God said and listen to him. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I pray every day. And this isn't something I've asked for, but it's something that has been given to me. I've been given 10 people at Starbucks. Jim, the one with no scruples, who has all the jokes, looked at me one day and says, we're keeping you from your work, James. And I go, Jim, you are my work. <laughs> I pray people will see Jesus in you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, I pray that as we interact with those who are around us, I pray that as we come into contact with people in this community and everybody comes into contact with their friends, that those friends will look at us and say, I see something different in you. What is it? And we will be able to say, I know Jesus. That's what makes me different. Would you like me to share and tell you about him? I pray that we can open up spiritual conversations with others. I pray that we can be a light in a dark world. And I pray that our speech will be seasoned with salt. 
so that it can answer everyone in the appropriate way. Lord, I pray that your spirit will be upon this congregation and this church. Be with this people as they reach out to a lost world. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.